Thanks for giving me, first of all, the chance to respond to that. Uh, I would agree with you that uh, restorative justice, which is what uh, I think the bishop's document has talked about, needs to be put into action. That document uh, that we issued was, when I first became a bishop, was in 1999 or 2000. It was one of those two years. And uh, we need to work, first of all, in community. We know that. And you know that too. We, uh, I, I'd love to be able to say that we as a Catholic community on our own can make a difference, but I will say this in the Commonwealth of Kentucky where I serve, we're working hand in hand with many people. And you're absolutely right that uh, there's a pastoral presence that I think is a very important spotlight and witness. Uh, in two weeks I'll be uh, celebrating Mass in uh, Marion uh, Correctional uh, Adjustment, they call it Adjustment Center, and, uh, and also on Thanksgiving, on uh, Christmas, and on Easter itself to celebrate Mass or prayer service in a correctional facility. Now, why is that important? I think it's important because we need to put a spotlight on the reality of, of what's happening. Uh, our efforts, I think, as a comp, first of all, to support legislation is, is there, it's documented. Uh, do we need to do more? Yes, but we need to do it in partnership. There's no question about that. So I would, I would agree with you. I think people are hungry uh, to reach out, uh, especially to people who are incarcerated. I agree with you. Thanks. All right, yes, sir. Reverend Esteban Lugo with the Christian Reform Church. I guess, and, and mainly to uh, Reverend Jim, I, I struggle with the issues of racial injustices and racial, uh, how should I say it, economics that continue to, to happen in the church where we have various people of color constituencies because of the system that exists in many of our churches and denominations that uh, basically pits one ethnic group over, or, or pits one against the other for financial support or economic support. And so it's a system that is competitive rather than developing this, uh, you know, this beloved community that we're talking about, where, where the various people of color constituencies are standing together, uh, you know, supporting each other. We don't see that very often. How, how, how can we address this? Because there is, within the church, racial divide that continues to happen. But it's a, it's a system, it's systemic. How do we address that? How do we deal with that? Uh, so that we can move on and become that beloved community. Another period, and I soon will get in trouble with someone, but it'd be good trouble, necessary trouble. Um, back in another period, 50 years ago, I remember so well, President Kennedy invited a group of us to the White House. This, Jim, this is leading up to the March on Washington. And President Kennedy didn't like the idea of a March on Washington. And he said, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder? And we will never get a civil rights bill through the Congress. And A. Philip Randolph, so Dean of Black Leadership, Labor Leader, Civil Rights Leader, spoke up and said, Mr. President, in his baritone voice, there's been an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent protest. So we left that meeting with President Kennedy, went out on the lawn of the White House, and we told the press we were going to have a march on Washington. And a few days later, we met in New York City and invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in issuing the call for the March on Washington. It was a coalition of what we call a coalition of conscience. And the religious community were well represented. Protestant, Catholics, 
members of the Jewish community, and Walter Ruther of organized labor. And when I see the, the film and the photographs from that day, there were churches, people from different religious organizations and groups from all over America. And we can do it again. I'm not saying another march, but we can build a coalition of conscience, a coalition of faith. So why not? This group, can I get out there and, and, and do what Lyndon Johnson said? Make me do it. Why can't we, we make a president? Do it. When, when Dr. King received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, he came back to Washington, had a meeting at the White House with President Johnson. And he told President Johnson, we needed a voting rights act. And Dr. King said, we don't have the votes in the Congress to pass a voting rights act. I just signed a civil rights act. You're going to make me do it. And we went to Selma. We intensified efforts. And Dr. King made an appeal. And two days after Bloody Sunday, more than a thousand religious leaders, priests, rabbis, nuns, ministers, came. And sometimes we have to move our feet. We pray, we get up and move our feet. We have to find a way to dramatize. People used to ask me in, in, back in Nashville during the 60s, what should we do, John? I said, we need to find a way to dramatize the issue. Put a face on it. Maybe we need to go to Kentucky, go to Mississippi, spend time in Alabama, in Tennessee, where people in the urban centers of our country, where there's hunger, where people not get enough to eat, not receiving a good education, not receiving health care. We have to put a face on it, dramatize it. I think uh, in the letter that uh, King wrote to answer your, your question, he says, there was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not really a thermometer. They recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat to transform the mores of society. Small in number, they were big in commitment. We don't take the witness and history of the early church seriously. When we let the world squeeze us into its mold, uh, what happens when we reproduce the racial and gender and class divisions of our culture? And what happens there is nobody, we're not any longer evangelistic. Why should anybody care what we're saying? But what we're doing is the same thing that others doing around them. So we have to take the early church's example very seriously, and it was a racially and gender and economically a transformational community. And that's, I think, King had it right. That's where we have to go back. When, small in number, they were big in commitment. All right, Brother Tom Williams says, he's showing me a zero. <laughs> and I believe that means stop. Let's give a hand to all of our panelists. Come on, thank you. Oh, there we go.